peace building and African politics. It's been 
published in international security, comparative political studies, comparative politics, journal of peace research, African affairs, and I'm proud to say studies in comparative international development, which happens to be an article that we collaborated on together. Uh, I'm very pleased Phil, Phil is, a, is also a former student of mine, um, along with Roger and Fatini, um, and it's great to have him back, and I know he's a great alumnus of the SSP program. Um, in 2020, Phil was awarded uh, the Harry Frank Guggenheim Distinguished Scholar Award for research on armed groups and peace building for his work in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, he's received Fulbright support, Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, Belfer Center support, um, and from the USAID. Um, and he got his PhD here at MIT in 2019. Um, and it's really just terrific to see him again and to welcome him back. And he's gonna talk to us today um, about, about some of that research, um, embedded commanders, rebel governance, military integration, and state building after civil conflict. And I know that he is struggling to get our next paper done in time because he's got a book contract, which, um, which we're very excited about for him. So I'm giving a pass on that. But it's great to have you here, Phil. Welcome. Thanks so much, Evan. Uh, it's a great honor to be here back inside the walls of E40. Uh, I remember when I was a graduate student here at MIT, you know, I would come to these SSP seminars every week you know, partly for the engaging speakers, partly for the free food. And, you know, at that time, you know, I was, I was the nervous graduate student sitting in the back row thinking, you know, if you, were, if you were ever invited as a speaker to the SSP series at MIT, you'd know you, that you really made it. So uh, I'm, I'm sorry that Roger Peterson couldn't be here, but thank you so much for that kind introduction, Evan. Uh, it's great to reconnect with folks here. So I'm gonna talk about uh, my book project, which began as a dissertation inside these walls. And this book is about two things. First, it's about the role that local field commanders play in civil wars, the roles that these commanders play in governance of civilian communities as well as post-war military integration processes. Field commanders are these critical political actors in conflict-affected societies. They're the ones that control the means of organized violence on the ground. Often they control large parts of the economy. And yet, we actually know very little about these commanders, about their behaviors, and why they sometimes contribute to the project of post-war state building and stabilization, and why they sometimes resist that. At a more abstract level, this book is also about the emergence of political order in weak and conflict-affected states. In particular, my project highlights the tension between local institution building that can be welfare enhancing for local civilians on the one hand, and the emergence of centralized rule on the other. My argument connects the type of rebel governance that emerges in rebel-occupied communities in civil war to the resources that commanders carry into the post-war transition and their incentives to resist the central state-building project of post-war elites. And my argument challenges the conventional wisdom out there that wartime institution building is good for post-war state-building. Actually, the opposite can be true. Rebel governance that creates embedded, popular, and legitimate commanders can actually result in military actors that are very difficult for the central state to control in the aftermath of conflict. So this is the agenda for my talk today. I'll start by talking a little bit about the basic puzzle of commander resistance in the aftermath of rebel military integration processes. What are the major research questions and the motivations for them in this book? Then I'll give a bird's eye view of the major argument of the book which is about how the type of wartime governance that emerges in occupied communities shapes whether or not local field commanders remain embedded in those communities through the post-war transition or not, and then ultimately how that affects their capacity and motivations to resist the central state building project in the post-war period. Then I'll give uh, a few highlights of some of the subnational evidence in the book from Cote d'Ivoire, which is the major case study. 
Um, there's cross-national and sub-national evidence in the book, but I'm going to highlight three pieces of evidence just um, to give you a taste of some of the analyses in the book. Number one, I'll talk about the relationship between patterns of wartime rebel rule and the relationship that commanders are able to sustain with formerly occupied communities. Second, I'll talk about uh, the relationship between wartime governance and mutinies and protests against the central state in the post-war period. And finally, I'll mention some evidence about the link between wartime governance and citizen police relations in the post-war period. Uh, and then depending on time, we'll wrap up um, maybe with a few thoughts on where I'd like to take some of this research from here. All right, so let me start with the basic motivating question that inspired this project. Why couldn't Ivorian rebels build a loyal army? Here's Cote d'Ivoire, country in West Africa that was divided by a civil war from 2002 to 2011. And you had a basic territorial partition where the northern half of the country was controlled by an insurgent group called the Force Nouvelle, or the FN who was fighting on behalf of excluded, marginalized ethnic groups in the north. They were also largely a breakaway faction of the Ivorian military. After about nine years of stalemate in this war, there was an election crisis that some of you may recall in 2011, where the sitting president of Cote d'Ivoire, Lauren Bagbo, refused to accept the results of the elections, which is something that maybe we know something about in the United States as well. And in this case, this triggered a resumption of the war. The rebel army swept down from the north, deposed Lauren Bagbo, and installed a new president, Alassane Ouattara, who remains in power as the president of Cote d'Ivoire today. As a reward for this military victory, Ouattara dissolved the old national army of Cote d'Ivoire and resurrected it as the Force Republicaine de Cote d'Ivoire. And this new national army was largely staffed and commanded by the Force Nouvelle. The former commanders of the Force Nouvelle became the leading commanders of the Ivorian army, took up the most uh, prestigious and sensitive posts in the state security apparatus. Uh, in the picture here, you see two of these commanders, Isiaka Ouattara and Sherif Usmain, who were powerful zone commanders of the FN army in the north during the Civil War, uh, and they both took turns as head of the Republican Guard in the post-war period. But despite this apparent you know, victory and success, loyalty did not last long in the Ivorian case. These former armed group commanders that integrated into the Ivorian military resisted implementing a lot of the government's plans for security sector reform and disarmament of these former wartime networks. Instead, they sustained ties to large networks of ex-combatants throughout the country and periodically would mobilize these armed networks against the government to get what they wanted. In 2017, while I was doing field research in Cote d'Ivoire, there was a massive outbreak of mutinies across the country where former rebel soldiers who were inside the army came out of the barracks and took control of police stations and gendarme stations around the country. They kidnapped the defense minister briefly and this was a show of force against the Watara government. They wanted bonus promotions and payouts. After a little bit of you know, crisis negotiation, the Watara government basically gave in and caved, uh, gave these concessions to these mutinying soldiers and temporarily resolved the crisis. Now what's puzzling about that kind of event is that it contrasts with outcomes that we see in other cases of rebel military integration. In cases like Zimbabwe, after the Civil War where the ZANU-PF defeated the white apartheid state in the 1970s, or the Rwandan Patriotic Front, which became the Rwandan Patriotic Army in Rwanda, these were cases where integrating field commanders remained highly loyal to the political elites that they installed into power. And in fact, these cases inspired a lot of scholarship, uh, you know, basically making the argument that rebel victory is good for stability. Rebel military, military integration can be a successful folding because your 
basically soothing former belligerents' security concerns by giving them a position inside the army. But if we look cross-nationally, we see a tremendous amount of variation in outcomes in the aftermath of rebel military integration. By my count, since 1946, there's been about 60 cases of this as the primary means of civil war termination to major civil conflicts. So criteria for inclusion here is A, there was a civil war where an armed group challenged a sitting government, and B, that armed group succeeded in integrating its military forces into the existing state army, right? So if there was just some agreement on paper that promised military power sharing, but then it was never implemented, I'm not counting that as a case of mil rebel military integration. So the countries in pink here just show you uh, the cases that are included in this sample, right? So where this has occurred since 1946. And of these cases, by my coding, over half have experienced a major episode of defection by an integrating field commander. A commander that belonged to the armed group during the Civil War, integrated into the military, and then turned their guns on the political leaders that they installed into power, either through organizing a mutiny, as in Cote d'Ivoire, or in more extreme cases of joining an open rebellion or launching a coup. And in many cases, these instances of commander defection have led to the collapse of state regimes and civil war recurrence. In addition to this cross-national variation, there's a lot of sub-national variation inside cases as well. Right? So just think about the case of Cote d'Ivoire. In 2017, a lot of commanders were mobilizing their armed networks against the government, but not all of them. Some commanders remained loyal. Some remained you know, steadfastly in support of the state building project of the elites that they installed into power. Ex-rebel commanders are not a homogenous block. Often they're following their own strategies, right? And so I'm interested in explaining this variation, both cross-nationally and sub-nationally across individual commanders. So this leads to the major research questions of the book. Number one, why does rebel, rebel military integration sometimes produce obedient militaries that permit the consolidation of centralized state authority, but in other cases it does not? And what explains individual level variation across commanders? Why do some resist the central state building project of elites in the capital city? Why do they resist demobilizing their irregular wartime armed networks? Why do they launch mutinies or coups or rebellions, while others don't do those things, while others remain loyal. So we can turn to the existing literature for you know, some ideas that have been brought to bear about these problems. There's a long tradition in the Civil War termination literature focused on the role of third party intervention and the problem of anarchy. And the problem here that you know, scholars like Walter and others have pointed out is that in the aftermath of civil wars, state institutions are weak. You don't have a credible you know, enforcer to make sure that commitments are abided by. And as a result, there's serious commitment problems that crop up in post-war states, right? So military actors in particular, they don't want to get rid of their military power that they can use to defend themselves. They don't want to commit to some uncertain or potentially risky new institution building or state building project that would involve them giving up even momentarily their own power and their own ability to defend themselves. And so scholars have made the argument that the only way out of this problem really is third party enforcement. You need some external power that's going to come in that's going to say, OK, you know, here's the timeline for rebuilding the new military. You're going to temporarily take away you know, your arms and networks, and then you'll integrate. And there'll be some external peacekeeping force that will sort of bridge that security gap. So I agree that 
Commitment problems and the problem of anarchy are very central to understanding the behavior of these ex-rebel commanders through the military integration process. I'm less convinced that third-party interventions actually resolve this problem adequately. If we look empirically, it's not that hard to find prominent cases where well-resourced and long-lasting third-party interventions have failed miserably to shepherd through a successful military reconstruction effort. South Sudan, Iraq, Afghanistan, I mean, you can think of many cases here. And largely, you know, or in part, I should say, this is because the state building project that third party enforcers often want is at odds with what local military actors want and what they view as being in their own best interests. So a second group of scholarship from the Civil War termination uh, camp has put the emphasis less on third party intervention and more on the terms of settlement, right? So maybe the way that the Civil War ends will shape post-conflict outcomes. One of, you know, one of the through lines of this literature has been that military victories, right, where there's a clear victor that emerges, they can monopolize power. That's what you want coming out of a civil war. That's what's going to facilitate successful institution building because that victor can monopolize power. They can, you know, keep challengers at bay. The issue here is that if we actually look empirically, there doesn't seem to be an association between rebel victory and reduced incidence of commander defection. Whether we're looking at cases of military integration through a power sharing arrangement or through rebel victory, there's practically, uh, there's practically no difference there. Even victorious rebel coalitions like in Cote d'Ivoire face these problems of trying to transform a wartime organization into an incumbent military that comes with a lot of tricky problems. Other scholars have talked about ideology potentially being important. You know, maybe if the armed group is inspired by revolutionary beliefs like Marxist-Leninist beliefs or Islamist ideologies, that these sort of revolutionary ideas and belief systems could inspire more loyalty on the part of military commanders to their political leaders and help them build you know, more organizational discipline. But ideology cuts both ways, right? The same ideology that could inspire loyalty on the part of commanders could also inspire grievances, right? If they think that the political elites are not living up to those revolutionary ideals, they might actually you know, launch a coup or a rebellion to replace them with more effective leaders. And that's something that we've seen quite frequently. Finally, coming out of the literature on civil military relations and coercive institutions, there's been a lot of work emphasizing the role of ethnic ties and ethnic cleavages. If military commanders and political elites are part of the same ethnic group, they'll be embedded in the same social networks. It's easier for them to develop trust and share information. And this might be important for understanding why commanders remain loyal or you know, resist those regime elites. So I think there's a lot to these arguments, and we actually do see pretty sh compelling evidence in the record of rebel military integration that when you have co-ethnic ties between regime leaders and commanders, that is a force for stability. But ethni ethnicity is too crude of a variable to account for all variation here, especially when we're looking at that subnational variation across individual commanders. It's a less useful explanatory framework. In the case of Cote d'Ivoire, for example, almost all of these ex-rebel commanders from the Force Nouvelle were ethnic northerners. They shared the same ethnic group as President Ouattara that they put into power, and yet there was a lot of striking variation in their behavior. So building on this work and taking it as you know, a point of departure, what my argument is going to suggest is that we need to understand the local political resources that these commanders build up during the wartime period and how those resources shape their available bargaining power. We need to understand 
whether these commanders have the local mobilization capacity and legitimacy in the communities that they formerly controlled in order to understand their political calculus in the post-war period. Okay. So in broad strokes, this is the summary of the argument of the book. I'm gonna walk through it, um, you know, going from the top in the wartime period to the ultimate dependent variable, commander resistance or loyalty at the bottom. We can get into some of the nuances that I'm gonna gloss over here in the Q&A. But essentially, the argument goes like this. During civil wars, rebel groups have to acquire obedience and compliance from the civilian populations that they control. To do that, they could rely purely on coercion, but that's costly and inefficient in the long run, and so they're likely to turn to some set of governance institutions to solicit that civilian obedience. There's been a lot of literature on these variations in wartime governance types and institutional arrangements, uh, you know, work by Zach Mampilli, Anna Arjona, you know, Weinstein, Megan Stewart, a lot of scholars have been thinking about how do these wartime institutions vary. What I'm going to do is take that theorizing as a point of departure to study the legacies of these different forms of wartime governance for commanders' behaviors in the post-war period. So let's start on the left-hand side and let's walk through two stylized theoretical scenarios. So if rebel rule in the wartime period is predatory. That is, there is limited goods provision for civilians. There's limited effort to restrain abuses of civilians by occupying rebel soldiers. And there's no mechanism for power sharing or participation among the population. That is a form of wartime governance that is likely to result in non-embedded commanders, commanders who have weak ties to the population, weak ties to local elites. And once they leave these communities in the post-war period, once the commander integrates into the army and goes somewhere else, it's gonna be very difficult for them to sustain legitimacy, sustain access to local social networks in those areas. As a result, these commanders are gonna have limited mobilization capacity and low bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis the central state in the post-war period, right? They're basically dependent on political elites in the capital to you know, give them a position inside the post-war military, and they don't have external autonomous sources of mobilization capacity that they can turn to. Because of this, these commanders you know, wind up with little choice but to go along with the central state building plan of regime elites. And they don't have a lot of incentive to resist it, in part because they have limited mobilization capacity, but also just because central, centralized state building is not so threatening to them. They don't have that much to lose. They don't have very strong political or economic networks inside peripheral areas of the country anyway. So it's better to get on board with the state building program that elites in the capital city want to implement. Okay, on the right-hand side, we have a different story. In areas where collaborative rebel rule emerges, that is where there is widespread goods provision for civilians, there are efforts to restrain abuses, there are mechanisms for power sharing and participation in local decision-making. That's the sort of responsive and welfare-enhancing governance that is likely to produce embedded commanders, commanders who have strong and enduring ties to these communities where they have a lot of social support, moral recognition, and legitimacy among the population as legitimate sources of governance and authority. Embedded commanders negotiate with the central state from a fundamentally different position. For these commanders, they have a lot of bargaining power. If they don't want to do something, that the president wants them to do, they have a lot of leverage at their disposal. They can make life very uncomfortable for elites in the capital city. They also are likely to be more threatened by the centralized state building mission of elites in the capital city. They are not interested in institutions from the capital being redeployed into their areas. 
that might threaten their hold on local commercial or economic networks or threaten their ability to you know, maintain their political support base. So for these reasons, embedded commanders tend to have both more capacity and stronger motivations to resist central elites in the capital. Now, my argument is mainly concerned with whether or not we see commander loyalty or commander resistance. We can talk about the degree of commander resistance, right? There's a big difference between, you know, uh, resisting a demobilization program and launching a coup to depose the president. Part of that has to do with what the regime elites are going to do in response and whether they are successfully deterred or whether they try to purge the commander. So that's sort of a secondary dynamic that we can you know, talk more about. Um, but primarily uh, in this talk, I'm going to be concerned with this basic distinction between whether we see loyalty or any resistance. Okay. So here's an empirical overview of the different components of the book where I'm marshalling evidence both subnationally and cross-nationally to try to explore this argument. The heart of the book is a series of chapters on the Civil War in Cote d'Ivoire, where I conducted field research, did a lot of interviews with former combatants, with government officials, with individuals in former rebel-occupied communities. I've been building an original data set on rebel-occupied localities in Cote d'Ivoire that tracks the type of rebel governance that emerged, the nature of post-war commander community ties in those communities, and whether or not we observed mutinies or other forms of resistance by former rebel actors against the state. In addition, there's a chapter um, looking at qualitative comparisons from a couple of uh, a couple of towns in northern Cote d'Ivoire that I selected on the basis of a matching technique. Uh, and then zooming out from the Ivorian case, I have an analysis of 60 cases of rebel military integration since the Second World War. So what I'm going to talk about now is just a couple pieces of evidence focused on the subnational component here. And if you're interested, we could talk a little bit about the cross-national component in the Q&A. All right, so here's Cote d'Ivoire, and as a refresher and you know, reminder to those who may not have studied this particular country in much depth, the civil war that afflicted Cote d'Ivoire in you know, the mid-2000s was essentially an ethno-nationalist civil war driven by the political exclusion of ethnic northerners in the country. The regime of Laurent Bagbo had an ethnically exclusionary ideology. Uh, they were taking steps to purge northerners from the military. This triggered a rebellion and defection by uh, ethnic northerners inside the Ivorian military in 2002, who wound up in control of the northern half of the country. So here are the zones of control under the FN uh, during the Ivorian Civil War. And you can see that they divided up this territory, which is you know, about twice the size of Austria, into 10 different administrative zones. Each of these zones was controlled by uh, these people that called themselves zone commanders. And below that, you had smaller sector commanders who controlled smaller areas. And you know, below that, you had sort of platoon-sized units. My analysis is mainly going to focus on these zone and sector commanders as the key power holders and the key agents of governance in the North during the Civil War. All right, so the first major data collection effort in this book is just to document the forms of wartime governance that emerged in the rebel-occupied North of Cote d'Ivoire during the Civil War. So what I'm showing you on the map here is the distribution of sub-prefectures in northern Cote d'Ivoire and how I've coded them in terms of the nature of rebel rule that emerged there. So the darker it shaded, the more collaborative rule was in this area, and the areas that are shaded lighter had more coercive or more predatory rule. So how am I coming up with this coding scheme and categorization? In 2017, I implemented a survey of community informants in 93 different sub-prefectures and localities across Cote d'Ivoire. 
These were essentially extended day-long interviews with traditional leaders, civil society leaders, teachers, other people who had a wealth of local knowledge about the histories of these localities, what happened during the Civil War, what kinds of goods provisioned by the rebels there were, and what was the relationship between different figures in the community and these commanders. On the basis of those community informant interviews, I code this uh, measure of collaborative rule that ranges from negative one to positive two. And the indicators here, um, this scale is based on four indicators, right? Whether there was widespread goods, goods provision, whether there was restraint on civilian abuse, whether there was mechanisms for power sharing and mechanisms for civilian participation. So the darker it's shaded, the more of those things that this community had during the war. Now, I'm happy to talk, uh, you know, maybe in, in the Q&A about um, the reasons for this variation, right, which is an interesting question in itself, right? Why did some areas witness much higher quality governance than others? And there are a couple of variables that you might think would be very important that turn out to not have so much explanatory power. So ethnic demography, for one, right? Maybe it's just the areas that were, you know, populated by ethnic northerners who already liked the rebels in the first place, so they had better relations and, you know, you wind up with more collaborative governance. Actually, we don't see any correlation at all between the nature of ethnic demography, pre-war political support for Watara, and these measures of collaborative rule. Um, a lot of areas in the West, actually, uh, that have collaborative governance, uh, these are very diverse places that are not just, you know, populated by ethnic northerners. Vote shares for Watara are much lower here, actually, than other areas of the rebel-occupied North. And so we can't account for this distribution of rebel rule in terms of pre-war support for the rebellion. Okay. So the second major component of data collection here, this is the first major dependent variable of the book, is commander embeddedness, right? Whether commanders were able to sustain ties with these communities in the post-war period. So here, again, I'm drawing on the community informant survey to measure things like, did the commander come back to this community after integrating into the military for private visits, right? Did they come uh, for funerals, for marriages, things like that. Did they offer material support to former combatants or youth in the community? Sometimes they would give you know, pocket money, sometimes you know, bags of rice or sugar, things like that. Is there evidence of an ongoing material relationship between commanders and the community? I measured whether they continued to provide order and security to the community in an informal capacity. Remember, this was not their job description, right? These were military officers who integrated into the military and had a role in, usually in the land army or the presidential guard of the post-war military. It's not their job to be going back to these places and fixing problems of local banditry, but in many cases, they did, right? They were solicited by the community to come back and you know, provide governance functions. And finally, uh, I measured whether or not commanders had a formal political position in the community, right? Whether they were elected as mayor or you know, a member of parliament uh, or a regional councilor or something like that. Okay. So the next slide I'm going to show you is taking these four indicators, combining them into a four point pendant variable, and then we're going to explain that variable in terms of the quality of wartime governance that was in that locality during the war and a number of control variables. And we see, as expected by the argument, there is a positive and significant relationship between the quality of wartime rule in these localities during the Ivorian Civil War and the strength of commander embeddedness in the post-war period. Notably, you know, whether or not had uh, northern ethnic composition does not seem to be a significant predictor of whether it maintained ties to a commander. In fact, the only other variable that 
uh, mattered a lot was population size, which makes sense because the larger, more populated places were tended to be areas where the rebels could invest in governance to increase their ability to tax and recruit. Okay, so this is the major, the first major finding of the book. Wartime rebel rule seems to be associated with post-war commander embeddedness in these communities even after they have integrated into the army. All right, so the second key analysis in the book is looking at the relationship between rebel rule in the wartime period and the occurrence of mutinies and protests by former rebel soldiers against the state in the post-war period. So I collected a new data set on mutinies and demobilized rebel protests. So mutinies against the government by ex-rebel soldiers who are inside the army, that's mutinies, and protests against the government by ex-rebel soldiers who are not integrated into the army, that's demobilized rebel protests. In both cases, these are indicators of commanders' power and capacity to organize collective resistance against the central government. And what we see is that there does seem to be you know, much stronger or higher average rates of collaborative rule in those localities that also saw mutinies. Similarly, in localities that had demobilized rebel protests, on average, they have higher scores on the wartime governance index, right? So again, consistent with the idea that in areas where the Force Nouvelle governed in welfare-enhancing ways, commanders sustained ties to local armed networks and were able to mobilize those networks against the state as a tool of coercive bargaining. And this is just showing you know, how the predicted number of mutinies in a given locality year changes as you go from the most predatory form of wartime governance to the most collaborative form, showing a positive relationship. You know, overall, these numbers are a pretty small, right? The, the odds that any given locality sees a mutiny in a specific year is, is pretty low overall. But when you aggregate this up over time, you wind up with pretty significant figures. OK. So this is the last piece of quantitative evidence that I'm going to show you. Your brain's probably starting to get a little bit fried, but I think that this one's really, really interesting, so I wanted to talk about it. What I'm showing you here is a figure that depicts the relationship between the quality of wartime governance in rebel-occupied communities and the choices that citizens make in the post-war period about who they view as a legitimate source of governance and security in the post-war period, right? It's important to consider whether rebel governance creating embedded commanders actually disrupts the relationship between citizens and redeploy redeployed police forces in the post-war period. So this is based on a survey of 1,200 uh, Ivorians in conflict-affected areas of the country that I carried out in 2018. And one of the questions we asked on this survey is asking people a hypothetical, you know, if you were a victim of a crime, who would you turn to for conflict resolution or, or, or for support for that crime, right? This is a question that criminologists like to ask to kind of weigh relations between citizens and police in different environments. And so they have different options that they could choose from. Right? They could turn to an NGO, a family member, local politician, an ex-combatant, former commander, a traditional or re religious leader, or the police and gendarmes. And what we see is that if we increase the quality of wartime rebel governance in a locality from its minimum to its maximum, citizens become more likely to turn to commanders. They also become more likely to turn to traditional or religious leaders. And consequently, they are less likely to turn to the official police, right? The redeployed police forces in their community who are supposed to be, right, in theory, this is, these are the folks who, you know, they, they should be turning to. Uh, but these informal sources of security and governance persist into the post-war period. 
So I think this is a really interesting um, additional pathway by which wartime governance seems to get in the way of or hinder a centralized state building project. Okay, so let me briefly walk you through two qualitative cases to wrap things up. So here's one case study uh, that I take a look at, at in the book. Uh, this guy is Fofier Kwaku Martin, who's no relationship to me, and he was the commander of Corhogo, one of the larger cities in northern Cote d'Ivoire during the Civil War. Now, Fofier is a very interesting character. He cultivated uh, this reputation as being this very strong ally of the community. He would hold regular meetings with civilians. He would uh, partner with local hunting associations to um, you know, prevent crime in the community, sort of seen as a guy with you know, a, a firm hand, but was fair. And because of his effective governance capacities during the war, Fofier sustained a lot of popularity and a lot of legitimacy in Corhogo into the post-war period. He maintained a very, very large private army and a lot of mobilization capacity throughout the city. So he had a series of arms caches that he hid around, uh, that he hid around Corhogo. He maintained ties to demobilized ex-combatant networks in the city. He maintained ties to local traditional elites in Corhogo. He was basically, when I you know, did research here in 2017, still a very central political figure in the city, despite the fact that he had no official role there, right? He was integrated into the military and he was supposed to be in the capital in Abidjan. One UN group of experts reports uh, in 2015 actually estimated that he alone had more firepower than the rest of the Ivorian military just by himself. In 2017, tensions boiled over between Fofier and President Ouattara. They'd been sort of uh, in a deteriorating relationship for years where they were trying to relocate him out of the country. At one point they tried to fire him, but they had to back down from that. One of his lieutenants that I interviewed in Corhogo, you know, he explained the mutinies that happened in 2017 by saying, you know, we're the ones who put Ouattara in power and, and we can take him out again, right? He's got to listen to our demands and, you know, we won't be pushed around by this by this president in the capital city. You know, the Watcher government, and the UN mission, while it was in Cote d'Ivoire, tried to push back on this guy, uh, tried to relocate him. One UN official that I talked to said, you know, we tried to cut his branches, but, but the roots run deep. Ultimately, they weren't willing to rock the boat and risk that Fofier might escalate things even further. Okay, so a very different story happens uh, in another community in western Cote d'Ivoire called Maha Pleu, which was governed by uh, a, another former uh, military officer, this guy, Commandant Ando. And unlike in Cote d'Ivoire, Ando is not a popular character in Maha Pleu. Governance by the FN in this locality was very abusive and coercive throughout, um, throughout the armed conflict. There was basically no mechanism for communication or participation of the population in local decision making and very limited goods provision. As a result of this, he's not welcome there today. One local elder that I you know, interviewed said, you know, look, if that guy came, you know, basically the, we would run him out of town. I mean, we put up with him when we had to, <clears throat> but now we don't want to see this guy again. So he lost his ties to the community He's not in touch with the ex-combatants who live in this community today. In 2017, there was very little that happened in Maha Pleu. Most of the ex-combatants that I interviewed there, you know, they said, no, we, we didn't participate in these mutinies. We're not really involved in that anymore, right? They don't see themselves as connected to, uh, you know, to the politics of going on between commanders uh, and President Ouattara. Um, you know, for me, the fight is over. This is what one of them said. And Ando himself, you know, he, he basically sat it out. He remained loyal to the president. Um, you know, he didn't come out against the mutinies, but he also didn't support them in any way. All right. So let me wrap up with a couple implications. My project is underscoring the fact that rebel military integration 
is not a panacea for rebuilding successful states or consolidating centralized authority in the aftermath of civil wars. The literature has made the case that you know, victorious rebel coalitions ought to be successful state builders, that integrating former rebels into the military should soothe security concerns and create representative military forces. But we need to pay attention to the social roots and the political resources that these commanders carry in to the post-war transition, because this has a lot to do with their political calculus and behaviors. My book is also highlighting the unintended consequences of wartime institutions. Institutions and governance practices that are welfare enhancing for civilians in the short run during civil wars can later come to haunt the central government in the post-war period because they permit military actors to remain autonomous, locally embedded, powerful, and with strong incentives to resist the centralizing project coming out from the capital city. Finally, for those of you who might be interested in issues of civil military relations, coup proofing, coercive institutions, we have a lot of work in that literature looking at um, you know, this, these different strategies of coup proofing that leaders you know, sometimes turn to to try to mitigate the risks of anti-regime you know, collective action by the military. One, con you know, one implication of my analysis is that coup proofing tactics, including in Cote d'Ivoire, are often implemented in direct response to this problem of embedded military actors who have autonomous mobilization power and who present a direct threat to the interests of the state elite. And so I think this is you know, one potential explanatory variable that should be given some more attention in the literature on coercive institutions. Okay, so just briefly, a couple, you know, a couple extensions of where I wanna you know, take things from here. I have one project ongoing that's looking at regime strategies to manage these ex-rebel commanders, right? The, the state itself is not a passive actor. There are different uh, strategies that the president in the capital city can employ. They could try to undercut these embedded commanders and destroy their networks. They could try to co-opt them into the state and make use of them, right? So we, we see different strategies in different cases. Uh, and then more broadly, I have some other work looking at the longer term legacies of wartime rule for broader issues of post-war order and democracy. You know, asking questions like, you know, how does armed mobilization during civil war actually impact citizens' willingness to make claims on the state, right? So I have some evidence about police-citizen relationships. What about broader issues of state legitimacy and willingness to, um, in, you know, engage in formal electoral politics? And I'm, I'm also interested in the question of why ex-combatants choose to rally behind former armed group, group leaders or not, even when there's not much of a prospect of material support from those leaders. Okay, so I think I'll leave things there. Thanks so much for coming. Really looking forward to taking some questions. kind of the argument that ideology should make people loyal if they're all kind of on the same page, but that's not necessarily true. I'm curious about what I would see is a pattern whereby some ideologies kind of come with organizational blueprints to use. So you mentioned Marxist-Leninism. That often comes with this kind of very specific party mobilization structure that I would think enables the, the civilians to kind of build out a system that is better able to monitor their commanders. So I was curious about how ideology and specifically the institutions that different ideologies might lead to plays into this story. Great. Yeah, thanks uh, for the question. It was uh, right. That was the name? 
Great. Uh, well, thanks so much for coming, and thanks for the question. Um, you know, I, I think that ideology is a potentially important explanatory variable under certain conditions, right? And those conditions um, might include things like fighting a very intense civil war against the incumbent government, where in order to survive at all, the armed group is going to have to um, you know, rely a lot on inspirational beliefs and uh, probably have a motivating ideology to keep it together under you know, the pressures of warfare. And under those conditions, uh, we do see some ideological groups, some you know, Marxist-Leninist groups, um, that have relied on those ideological belief systems and they've persisted into the post-war period and at least appear to be responsible for some degree of stability, right? So one, one case there that I might think of would be Zimbabwe and ZANU-PF, and it did have you know, a motivating um, revolutionary ideology behind it, and if you talk to you know, military commanders in Zimbabwe today, of course they did end up turning on Mugabe eventually, uh, but, but prior to that, they would have said, like, look, we were, we were taught when, you know, back in the revolutionary days, we were taught that, you know, the party follows the gun and this is the structure that we put in place and we select cadres who are going to be behind that mission. Um, I, I think the, the issue there is that it is confounded by, uh, by the nature of war fighting itself and the fact that ZANU-PF fought a very bloody, intense civil war, and that might have been responsible for the types of organizational structures that it created rather than the ideology itself, right? You, you see other armed groups that proclaim a Marxist-Leninist ideology that you know, more exists on paper than in practice, right? So it, sometimes it can be the strategic dynamics of the civil war that perhaps matter more than the formal ideology that a group aspires to. But, you know, I think that this is a complex phenomenon that has multiple answers to it, right? Probably multiple variables that matter. Um, and so I don't want to dismiss ideology and say that it doesn't matter. I just think that there's variation that it can't explain and that I hope that my argument can, you know, explain some of that outstanding variation. Yeah. Hi, Chap. Thanks, Chap Walton. Hey, Chap. Yeah, me too. Um, so two, like, really minor things. Um, so I'll just throw them out there and you can integrate them or not. But the first is, I, I'm very old friends with multinomial logic because it's used in voting behavior models. And uh, you may want to, since it, it has this assumption about the independent of irrelevant alternatives built into it, it's required, um, you may want to rerun that analysis with just having it dichotomous of police versus seeking out the military yeah. commander. Not so much for this crowd, but I think in other crowds you might get that question. Also, small comment. I, I really wanted to see your central argument a little bit earlier in the presentation. That was, it was fantastic stuff. Uh, but the, the beginning part was a little harder to follow because we didn't have the organizing um, principle. So uh, the question is on the international cases and whether you wanted to say anything about that. Since you didn't have a chance to. Sorry, about, about the. Yeah, but all the all the other things. The cross-national. Right, cross-national. Cross yeah, sure. Yeah. So we can, maybe I can, you know, give a give a flavor of it, and if folks want to follow up on any on any of this, we can. Um, so it's map initially of 60 cases of rebel military integration, right? So that's cases where an armed group challenged uh, sitting government and actually carried out some degree of integration, right? So I'm not including cases where there's just some power sharing agreement on paper. I'm coding defection, so the dependent variable is whether or not within a 10-year window any of those integrating commanders from the armed group defected from the post-war regime. So that could be participating in a mutiny, anti-regime uh, coup or rebellion. Let's see if this still operates. Perhaps not. Okay. Well, in any case, um, and what, what I find there is that, um, I, I did have an extra slide with some of the cross-national results. What, what I find is that if we take uh, an indicator of 
wartime rebel goods provision, and here I'm using Megan Stewart's data set on insurgent governance uh, and Reiko Huang's uh, data set on rebel goods provision during the Civil War. And we just create a dichotomous variable about whether there was inclusive goods provision by that armed group during the Civil War. There are reasons why I think that that's one of the only valid indicators that we can actually measure across time. Uh, but if we just look at whether the armed group included, uh, provided goods on an inclusive basis during the Civil War, then we see that there's a significant positive relationship between that and the occurrence of defection within this 10-year window. Revolutionary ideology, not significant. Uh, you know, GDP per capita, not significant. Military victory versus negotiated settlement, uh, not significant. The only thing that is very significant, and it has just as much explanatory power, uh, power as wartime governance, is ethnic cleavages. So if the integrating military commanders came from a different ethnic group than the sitting head of state, then the risk of defection is higher, right? And, and that's very consistent with what we know from the existing literature. Great. Next question. I had Barry, Eric, Eric, and this woman here. I'll collect some more names after that. So I'm wondering whether you surface any information or, or understanding of how these local commanders dealt with the transition from war to peace. In other words, how they read the emerging peace settlement or the emerging constitutional convention after victory or whatever. Because it seems to me that your, your leaders who participated in local governance should have a lot more confidence in their ability to keep getting their way in some sort of actual political system. So the terms of the settlement won't be a winner-take-all moment for them, whereas for the commanders who were basically, you know, thugs, um, it was purely extractive, this is the last moment they had any power to influence the settlement. Once they're divorced from the area that they've drawn their resources from coercively and their units that did it, they're completely dependent. So for the reasons that you say they don't rebel later, they should be very problematical during the transition. Whereas for the reasons that those are problematical later, during the transition they can afford to take a more relaxed attitude. I'm just yeah. blue skying here deductively, but I'm just wondering do you see any patterns in yeah. that in the moment? Yeah. No, it's a it's a really good question and it's making me it's making me consider whether there is a, a separate discussion of this point that is worth integrating in uh, in here about this. Because the the basic logic would be that there's some window of opportunity here where the commander sees their own dependence on the central state coming, and so now's the time to maximize extortion, right, in order to seize the moment on, on this activity. And in fact, I believe that that is precisely what you saw across much of the capital city in Abidjan when it was newly conquered by the Force Nouvelle in 2011. They had been focused on fighting the war, right? So most of these commanders were mobilized away from the communities that they controlled for the march on Abidjan. They defeated the armies loyal to Lauren Bagbo, and once Bagbo was arrested, they were newly, you know, in charge of the big, you know, the, the big pot, which was controlling the capital city of Abidjan, right? Because that's where the most lucrative opportunities for extortion were. And exactly some of these commanders who had predatory and coercive, you know, histories in their past, I'm thinking of Sharif Usman, who is in control of the, of the city of Boaké, he became enormously powerful in many suburbs of Abidjan in this sort of uh, transitional period in 2011, 2012, 2013. And that was a period where I was not in Cote d'Ivoire then, but my interviewees related to me that this was uh, 
this was a terrible period. This was worse than the Civil War period in, in, during that initial phase of post-war transition because these commanders were setting up shop in a new zone and sort of establishing um, these, these extractive networks. And a lot of that has now been dismantled by now because it was sort of ephemeral and short term, as you said. So it didn't, it, it wasn't a permanent security problem in the way that the embedded commanders became a permanent security problem, but it was a short term spike in insecurity in certain zones of the country where these predatory commanders found themselves at the moment of the war ending settlement. Um, so, so I guess I would just say that I, I think that's a really interesting dynamic to unpack and, and it's maybe something that could be, you know, that would be worth thinking about and, and researching a bit further. Yeah. Thanks, Eric and for your I guess I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the, the policy implications of your findings if I am a post-war thinker, right? It sounds like I have no good solutions because during war, the, the solution that will keep me safe down the road is to allow predatory commanders, which might not be the ideal strategy for many of the reasons of terrorists. Right? But then these things that might be useful during conflict to have collaborative you know, types of relationships are threatening to be once peace comes. So what am I to do if I want to be a good you know, post-war leader? Um, because even the policy recommendations that you have for for group group, like undercutting uh, the, the networks that these leaders have is potentially going to drive you know, further animosity. Yeah, great. Yeah, thanks so much, Eric, uh, and it's nice to see you again. Um, and thanks for the question. So, so this is exactly uh, the the puzzle that I'm currently working through with uh, a couple colleagues of mine, uh, Jeremy Spate and Julia Piccolino. We're trying to build a typology of regime strategies to manage these former armed group leaders in the aftermath of rebel military integration, um, because there are uh, a menu of strategies that they can select from, all of which have some, some downsides and disadvantages to them, uh, and some are riskier gambles than others. In general, what have we seen in Cote d'Ivoire? I think we've seen a general evolution of the stance of the central government from early on in the post-war transition where it took quite a hands-off approach. I think it's fair to say that they were deterred by the power of these uh, embedded commanders from pushing too aggressively the security sector reform, the police reconstruction, the reform of security institutions that you know the UN mission kept harping on them about like you gotta you gotta implement this, right? The nobody's been demobilized, the DDR program's defunct, like why isn't this going anywhere? There's no political will. There's a very clear reason for that, is because you know. They, they don't have the bargaining power to push that through down the throats of these commanders who don't want it. Over time, that stance of, you know, kind of live and let live and will we'll grant these commanders their sphere of influence and not intrude on it too much, that has slowly changed over time. And you do see a more aggressive posture by the Watara government over time. In part, I think that that actually reflects um, the consolidation of a one-party autocratic state in Cote d'Ivoire since the end of the Civil War and the fact that, you know, the Watara government was in a more precarious political position in the early years of the transition and so they could not pursue uh, strategies that would involve purging or undercutting the networks of commanders uh, in too threatening of a manner. But once they had consolidated you know, a stronger electoral support base, and particularly when some of the other opposition parties sort of have, have been in real trouble and are, are falling apart, I think the government has felt more emboldened to actually push through some of these programs despite potential objections. And this came, this came to a real head uh, in 2019 uh, when the Watara government did actually uh, demobilize and forcibly retire, essentially, a bunch of former FN soldiers and officers. There was grumbling about it. The former leader of the FN, Guillaume Soro, you know, basically said that this was, uh, this was Watara turning into a dictator. He actually tried to call on some of his comrades to overthrow Watara, but it didn't work out for him, and Soro is exiled in Paris now. He's sort of like living uh, abroad and, and doesn't have much uh, 
uh, much influence yet, but maybe he'll make a comeback. So, so I think we've seen a, an evolution of the strategy of the government over time from a sort of spheres of influence approach where we're going to accept that we are blackmailed and cannot do much to getting a little bit more aggressive over time, both as the electoral and political support base of the president has independently grown, and perhaps as some of these commander community ties have decayed over time, right? I mean, the Civil War recedes into the background eventually, and, you know, so these relationships of um, moral recognition and legitimacy between commanders in these communities, they don't necessarily last forever, right? It's been 12 years now since the end of the war. Uh, and so my expectation would be that we'll probably see more and more aggressive tactics by the regime to get rid of some of these guys. I mean, Fofier is still around. He's still um, the commander of one of the major regional um, components of the land forces in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, but, but, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if he was sent abroad and kind of exiled into some defense attache role to kind of permanently get him out of the picture. That's not something that the government would have gambled on maybe five years ago, but I think in future they might, they might try to do that. There's more to say about that uh, question, but I'll, I'll leave the comment there. Thanks, Eric. Great. So I wanted to ask, uh, thank you, by the way, it's fascinating. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about the context of the Code of War case, which I'm not familiar at all. Um, so, you know, you're really framing, you have the integration of the rebels with the, the army. Um, some of the other cases that I am familiar with, especially in Asia, you actually have sort of the, the disestablishment of the military and then it's partial reintegration with the rebels. So it's sort of almost the opposite. So you've spoken a little bit to the balance in this case, but maybe you could say a little bit more. I was also curious, again, sort of in terms of context, uh, as far as disloyalty, you sort of said, I mean, mutinies is the operative word. I didn't, never heard the word, you know, coup or rebellion. So I'm sort of curious why it takes the form of mutinies and what that really was like in practice. And then finally, just really quickly, I guess I would follow up on or maybe support Wright's comment about ideology. I mean, there are issues about unity there, but I think it goes beyond that. Certainly in the Asian cases that I've looked at, I mean, ideology can define sort of the legitimate roles of the military and society afterwards, and obviously the degree of sort of uh, consensus on that point between the government and, uh, and military leaders. Thanks. Um, well, you know, I, I guess just to quickly hit on that point about ideology again, I. I suppose I don't disagree with that. I would just say that we do observe dramatic instances of commander resistance and military defections even within Marxist-Leninist regimes, right? And I mean, that pattern's well documented by Perlmutter and others. And so, so the ideology argument needs to explain that somehow, right? Why is it that you would still see so much defection and civil military strife inside and what should be some ideologically cohesive regime, right? So I'm not saying that it doesn't matter, but again, I think there are other bargaining dynamics that, uh, that are probably part of the, that story. Um, on, on mutinies versus coups and rebellions, I'm conceptualizing all of those actions as existing on a spectrum of resistance against central state authority, right? So you can imagine the most incremental form of resistance that a commander could make is to, you know, the order comes down that, hey, there's going to be a disarmament and demobilization program. The UN is funding it. Would you please send, you know, your thousand guys that are under your control to show up on this date, enter this cantonment camp, turn over their arms. They'll all go and get, you know, re, you know integrated into civilian life or perhaps be you know, retrained and given some other position in the military. So the commander can slow walk that and say, oh, I didn't get the memo, sorry. Um, or they can send half the number of people that were, you know, intended to go. Or they can send the wrong people and just send people that they know and friends and stuff and leave their actual networks of armed supporters with their weapons, right? So that's, 
a sort of the lowest level of resistance that you could conceptualize, right? Because they're not supporting the state building project that the state is wanting to go through with, but they're not trying to depose the central government either, right? Mutinies are a step higher on the rung of resistance, right? They're still not trying to depose the government, but they are saying, look, we do have the power to get rid of you. If you don't give us what you want, we can destabilize things, we can scare off foreign investors, we can make life a big headache for you, right? And so would you please hand over, you know, those promotions and payments that were that were promised um, or, you know, or, or give us some set of share of state rents. At the most extreme form of resistance, you do have efforts to actually get rid of the president, the coups, rebellions. I think those most extreme examples typically happen when the state ruler says, I do not accept being blackmailed by these commanders. I will try to purge them or otherwise get rid of them. That triggers you know, basically a spiral of conflict between commanders uh, and the state rulers, and there's preventive coups or a preventive strike against uh, against the leader. And Phil Rossler's model of preventive coups, you know, says a lot about that dynamic. So I think that we can we can think about disloyalty and resistance kind of existing on a spectrum like that. And just because you have a regime that manages to stay in power, right, through you know being blackmailed or successfully paying off its commanders, that doesn't mean that there's not uh, resistance happening there. It just means that the leader has calculated and played their hands in such a way that they've managed to stay in power despite that resistance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, I don't know. I don't think that he, will, he did play his hand very well. I don't know. Okay. Hello, I'm Vladimir Dyakova. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow here at SSP. Thank you for this very interesting talk. I'm a Civ Mill scholar, so I'm fascinated about everything of this. Uh, my question is about your argument, because the way I understood it is an argument about capability. Those who can resist, resist. Those who can't are happy to be integrated and don't resist the government. But from some of the evidence that you presented, uh, it seems like there also appears some theme of motivation, why they resist, and also what kind of policies they res the embedded commanders resist with higher likelihoods versus lower likelihoods. So is there an interesting variation within this embedded commander subgroup that can help us learn more about why they're doing it in terms of motivation, but not the capability? Yeah. Thanks, Thanks Polina. Um, yeah, so the question of motivation is an interesting one. If we start with the basic model of exiting war to peace under conditions of anarchy and a sort of, you know, Phil Rossler or Jesse Driscoll or Fertini Christia model, right, that everything's anarchy and the war ending settlement is basically an agreement among armed power holders who divide up the pie in some way. But because of, there's anarchy, everybody has some set of motivations for resistance, right? At least they have some set of motivations to maintain their own private mobilization power and capabilities because they don't know what the, the future is uncertain and you want to be able to make sure that you can protect your own interests. So from that basic model, all of these commanders have some incentive to resist, right? Because they face that problem of anarchy. But that's, that's defensively oriented motivations, right? Perhaps there are also, let's call them, for lack of a better term, offensive motivations, right? Where they want to acquire more, they want to enlarge their share of the pie, they want to you know, uh, gain more from the war ending settlement than, than they initially agreed to. There too, I think that capability and motivations are actually very closely interconnected in this story. So what do I mean by that? Embedded commanders who have strong ties to these communities in the post-war period are likely to have a lot more to lose from the centralized state building project of elites in the capital city, right? If the police are redeployed, if former rebel networks are demobilized, they lose a lot of power, they lose a lot of potentially economic revenue, their standing goes down quite a bit. So because of their initial high capacity, they also have stronger incentive and motivation to resist what the elites in the capital are trying to do. Now that might be accelerated and become even worse if because they are embedded, 
the president identifies them as a target, as a threat, and tries to purge them, right? So now they have both strong offensive and defensive motivations, as well as the capacity to act on those motivations. So that's why my argument essentially is primarily about capabilities, but, but I also expect that those capabilities affect how motivations play out at the same time. And at the end of the day, you get to the same expectation, right? That embedded commanders are more likely to have both capability and the motive uh, to resist. I just think, I mean, coming back to my own hobby horse, which was only generated by your talk, um, but there, you know, in, in terms of your division between defense and offense here, so if you get the capital, you get access to all kinds of international goodies. You get access to extraction from the entire state. So this is why I come back to the question. So you have one set of people who are thugs, and you just, that what happens when they get into the capital city is they pick a neighborhood there and go behave like thugs there because that's what they know, right? And that's all that they know. But if you have these sort of pseudo state-like leaders, these people who, who engage in politics, development, you know, coercion extraction, you know, the, the usual state story, they're looking at the capital and going, okay, I could lose in this game, I could win in this game, right? They get to play and compete in a bigger sandbox. There's more to gain. Even the control of the country may be there. I mean, I, I, what I know about African politics, you could fit the symbol, but I had this vague recollection that Moise Chambe was, in, in the Katanga, he was a rebel, but didn't he end up at one time as prime minister of, of, of the Congo? I think he did once, didn't he? There was some period where he got elevated, but I, I digress. The point is, is that I'm just wondering if, you know, I'm riffing on your description of the skills and capabilities that they have and wondering, uh, you know, do they have more complicated motivations than you're suggesting? I mean, I like a straightforward capabilities kind of analysis, but these guys have a kind of portfolio of capabilities that others don't. Yeah. It's an interesting possibility, I guess, to consider that I'll, that I'll have to keep thinking about whether there's an element of motivations here that is, yeah, per perhaps more complicated than, than just, you know, the defensive response of wanting to protect their interest vis-a-vis -vis the central leader and their incentive to sort of protect their fiefdom that they control, because maybe there are these additional sources of you know, revenue that they also have an interest in gaining some control over. So I think that that's very plausible, that's likely true. But these territories and peripherally governed areas of the country, they are the primary power base for these commanders, right? That is what makes them unique from just powerful businessmen in Cote d'Ivoire, right? Who maybe control a lot of stuff in the capital and who have wealth, but they are not the same security threat, and they're not the same political players that commanders are who have a wellspring of popular support in areas of the country that the central state just does not have very much power and control over. And that, that does make them uniquely political positioned, I guess, in this post-war context, um, you know, compared to just people who operate extortion rackets in the capital city or, or who, you know, make some money off of, you know, off of what's going on in the capital. So something that I want to think more about. Um, so thanks for, thanks for the comments. Yeah. Hi, uh, Renana Joyce. Hey, um, Renana. Hi, I feel, uh, I'm an assistant professor at Brandeis University. Um, yeah, so I was, uh, I was wondering if you could say a little more, maybe, and maybe this this came out particularly in your in your qualitative work um, about who these embedded commanders are actually mobilizing, right? So your your the story is about mobilizing from the community, um, but I was curious if you could say a little more about who they're actually mobilizing and and what is the relationship between how these commanders governed and how they led their own soldiers. Because in the two case studies that you gave us with the qualitative vignettes, 
one of the kind of striking things that came out was actually that the former combatants who had served under these commanders seemed to have very different levels of sort of willingness potentially to to remobilize under their under their former commander, right? The predatory yeah. commander, the soldiers like we're out. Um, the the embedded commander, there seemed to be a willingness to sort of more cohesion, more morale, more willingness to fight. And so I'm, I'm kind of wondering, is this, you know, is this mobilization story a story about being able to reactivate your former fighting networks, or is it a story about being able to activate new ones, drawing on these communities because of these ties, or, or are both factors yeah. at play? And maybe that came out in the qualitative work that you did. Yeah. Yeah, thanks so much, Renana. So, so I love this question. And the answer is, it is both, right? It is both former combatants who were with the commander during the wartime occupation and who remain embedded themselves in those communities, right? I mean, typically, there's some number of foot soldiers who are going to integrate into the army, but I mean, you know, at its height, the FN had like 60,000 troops, and the Ivorian army has, you know, maybe 6,000, you know, at, at that level. And so most did not get that. Most of the low level foot soldiers remained in these communities where, um, you know, where they were stationed during the war. And so that provides the first primary mobilization network that commanders are going to, you know, potentially be able to access. Then you have a secondary milieu or layer of those who maybe had an arm's length relationship to the rebellion during the Civil War. I'm thinking of, you know, people who belong to the, the Dozatan, the local hunting associations in northern Cote d'Ivoire, who allied with rebel commanders in some cases, like in Corhogo, right? Fofier actually gave these local Dozatan hunters like trucks and fuel and stuff and said, you know, you'll be my eyes and ears and you'll kind of work on behalf of us, but they weren't integrated, they, they weren't ex-combatants or they wouldn't call themselves ex-combatants today, right? That's not how they would see themselves. But they do have a relationship with these commanders, right? They do have a relationship with other local elites in those communities who sustain strong alliances with those commanders. So the answer is, you know, who are they mobilizing? First, they're mobilizing that core of former combatants who have a sort of formal relationship with them. And it's much easier for them to remain in touch with those combatants if they are, you know, if they have legitimacy and social support in the community. And then there's that broader network of potential armed supporters, right? People who could pick up weapons and go join in a protest if they were incentivized to do so. And those people especially, it's critical for the commander to have more recognition and legitimacy in the community. Otherwise, there's very little incentive for those people to, to mobilize with the commander. Yeah. I think I just have one more question. Yeah, um, uh, don't have I'm a post doc here. I just have a question uh, regarding the, the embeddedness and the bargaining power of those res, uh, commanders, and I was wondering if it was uh, linked to the person or if it was somehow transferable to other people in the network, or whether getting rid of one person could be the solution for the state. I mean, <laughs> not that I'm uh, favoring this niche, but <laughs> could it explain? It was could, because it could also predict uh, kind of behavior by central state. And... Right, so, so is, is embeddedness uh, highly personalized in the person of the commander, or is that inspire some popularity of the organization as a whole, right? My evidence, the evidence that I have would suggest that it is both, like there's both a specific individualized moral recognition, like Fofier is indispensable in the case of Corhogo, right? People also have positive views about the FN in general because it was actually viewed as a time of better governance than what the state provided before or after. And so, you know, so there's a more general, I guess, halo effect that the commander's effective governance is also providing for the armed group. Um, but it's not 100% transferable to any other individual, right? I think there's a real sense of, you know, wartime credentials and, you know, he, he was here with us through the worst of it and he saw us through and other places were doing poorly. And that that is, um, that, that does seem to me individualized to some extent. Um, but, but I guess I don't, have the, I don't have the evidence, I wish I did, to say which of those factors is relatively more important, right? Because I'm, I'm only measuring both of them in, in the post-war period. And so it's hard to 
necessarily pull them apart, tend to be intercorrelated, but, it, but it's an interesting, interesting question to think about more. Great. Well, I'm sorry there's not time for your rag question. Maybe they can hunt you down in the few minutes before we, we take you for lunch. But Phil, it was sure. terrific to be refreshed in all of this. You've put a whole new patina on it. It's terrific. Looking forward to the book. And I'm sure everyone will join me in thanking you for the presentation. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for the great questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm.